pleased to have two uh, really fantastic experts on Russia and Russia's foreign policy with us today. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce them uh, and then they will come on the screen and as we usually do we'll hear brief remarks from each of our speakers followed by a brief conversation with me uh, and then questions from all of you. So please remember to post questions if you like using uh, I think it's the Q&A feature. You'll get an announcement about that shortly. Uh, we, we welcome your questions. We'll, we'll definitely get to those uh, in the second half of the hour. Uh, but first, again, we're gonna hear from both Catherine Stoner and Dan Treisman. So let me briefly introduce them and then we'll start. So Catherine Stoner is the Deputy Director at the Freeman Spokely Institute at Stanford uh, and a Senior Fellow uh, at the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law, as well as CSAC and many other places at Stanford, including political science, et cetera. She seems to hold uh, or have many hats. Uh, most importantly for our purposes, Catherine is a longtime Russia uh, scholar and watcher and the author most recently of Russia Resurrected, Its Power and Purpose in a New Global Order, which was just published this year in February. Uh, after Catherine speaks, joining her on screen momentarily uh, is our own Dan Treisman of UCLA, Professor of Political Science, uh, Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, and as I discovered recently, Catherine and Dan actually went through the same PhD program. So um, they are longtime uh, friends and colleagues. And Dan will follow Catherine uh, in the discussion. And as I said, we will then pivot to a conversation. So uh, Catherine, take it away. Great, thank you so much for um, having me and hi UCLA from all the way up from Northern California. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and, um, and in particular to, to chat with you Cal and also Dan uh, about what's happening um, in the US-Russia relationship uh, as the Biden administration kicks off its uh, Russia policy. So I think one of the questions, since you asked us to speak for about seven minutes uh, each at the beginning here and then and then have a conversation, my challenge is going to be making sure I stay within those seven minutes. So um, I, I will make just a few quick remarks and then hopefully we can go more deeply into some of these issues. But um, we have, of course, a, a summit between uh, Biden and Mr. Putin that was now uh, has been confirmed as of yesterday for June 16th in Geneva. Um, and um, uh, this comes as an interesting point in U.S.-Russia relations. I've been um, attending by the virtues of Zoom some of the um, webinars in Washington um, over the past six months to a year. Um, and uh, that's probably the only positive thing to come out of COVID is that you can move around quickly. Um, uh, online. So uh, it is a common lament in, in Washington currently, and I just attended a, a talk last week um, where uh, people are saying this is the worst moment since the collapse of the Soviet Union. But um, uh, that seems to be updated or, or said every two to three years. Um, you know, we said that on the back of Russia's war with Georgia in 2008, um, the worst moment. Then Ukraine in 2014, that was the worst moment. Then Russia's electoral interference uh, in the American presidential elections in 2016, that was the worst moment. Um, and then deepening sanctions on Russia in the wake of um, Alexei Navalny's imprisonment um, and other events. And then Biden's killer remark just uh, a month or two ago um, regarding Putin, um, more sanctions this year. Now the diversion of a Lithuanian plane by Belarus to nab a leader of Lukashenko's opposition in Belarus, possibly with Russian help, uh, clearly with, with Russia's okay, at least, um, and Russia even lightly now trying to defend Belarus's right to have done this uh, over this past weekend. So, you know, uh, is this the lowest point now since the collapse uh, of uh, communism or of the Soviet Union in particular in 1991? And in 1991, relations were actually quite good. So I'm not sure that's a good, uh, reference point. Um, it could actually be the lowest point in, uh, in uh, our relations if we go back into the Soviet period um, since we boycotted the Moscow Olympics in 1980 over uh, the Soviet Union's invasion of Af Afghanistan. So maybe it's the lowest point in 40 years or could we go lower? Uh, evidently we, we you know, always can. Um, I think it's the wrong question. And I don't know that it's particularly helpful to describe 
or characterize relations um, this way, since we don't know what the lowest point is, of course. Um, it could be war, but we're not there and I don't think we're headed there. I'm somewhat optimistic actually about where we might be moving with relations with Putin's Russia currently. And I, I wanna distinguish between Russia and Putin's Russia, um, since I think Mr. Putin has led um, Russia on a rather distinctive and not inevitable path. So I suppose that's one uh, difference I have right off the bat um, with some realist scholars who would say, this is just a great power doing what great powers do and now it's recovered. And so not surprisingly, uh, it has become um, more assertive uh, with respect to its structured geographic interests, which don't change. Uh, I think that's wrong. I, I, I think of course, Russia has interests and in my book, I make this argument too. Russia of course has interests. Every country has interests which can be geographically determined um, or, or you know, culturally determined or what have you. But you know, um, those are those are uh, not always fixed. Uh, they can change over time, of course. And um, different administrations, different leaders of countries will, of course, have different policy interests and, and um, how they act on those interests, even structured interests are uh, can, can vary tremendously. And I think we've seen this even with Mr. Putin himself over the last 21 years that he's been in power in Russia in, in one capacity or another. So I think um, what I'm optimistic about is where we're moving with relations in terms of the commitment on both sides, it would seem, to moving toward predictability and stability um, in the relationship, but not necessarily comity and friendship and uh, you know new areas of cooperation. Although there are some potential areas where we could cooperate. So even if we don't view here in the United States, Putin's administration in, in Russia as uh, particularly friendly to the United States or to American interests, uh, in the wake of the constitutional changes that were made in Russia last summer, um, uh, he will be, if he chooses to be, and those around him enable it, uh, president of Russia until 2036. Um, so we have to currently and, and uh, for the foreseeable future, at least until potentially 2036, have to deal with Putin's Russia and Putin's foreign policy preferences. Um, so there are signs um, that uh, the Russians themselves, Mr. Lavrov uh, in his meetings with Blinken last week, our, our new secretary of state and other members of the Russian foreign, uh, foreign policy establishment and even 90 year old Mikhail Gorbachev have said they too are looking for uh, new predictability and stability in the wake of the Trump administration where they thought things would be good and then things turned out sort of messy. Um, the second thing I think that we are hearing um, uh, out of Washington, um, which I would take issue with um, about the relationship is that um, we're not seeing another reset, that uh, Mr. Biden is not going to fundamentally reset relations with Russia. Um, and um, they're noting that every other US administration since Eisenhower um, has uh, attempted some sort of reset uh, of relations with the Soviet Union um, or, uh, or now Russia um, and uh, all have uh, ultimately ended with a thud and, and worsening relations between the two. Biden himself, of course, announced Obama's reset in 2009 uh, in the Munich uh, Security Conference. So it's not as though he's unfamiliar with the idea of doing this. Anyway, I, I think that they're wrong here too. I think there is a resetting of the chessboard or of the relationship and that is toward predictability and stability and to some degree acceptance uh, of, of where we are in the world. And, and where we are now is uh, in a, a multilateral, um, a multipolar world, not, uh, not a unipolar world anymore. Um, the United States stepped back in, in terms of its global footprint uh, even starting under the Obama administration with our leading from behind policy. And uh, uh, Russia and China have, have stepped in. Um, and uh, the Trump administration, I think even more with America first, uh, made, made the US less relevant in important parts of the world. So, um, so there is inevitably a reset because the situation has changed uh, since uh, Biden last held office. Um, so how much is, is there a departure from what went before? Well, there are, as I mentioned, structural interests, fixed interests, and both countries have these to some degree, of course. Russia is a huge country, biggest in the world geographically, you know, 14 international borders, um, 
so it affects a lot of, of countries, right? Uh, different countries in different places. Um, actors have also uh, changed. The American administration has changed. Russian administration ha has not changed in the sense that Putin obviously is still in charge, but he is has evolved from uh, attempting to befriend George W. Bush in 2000 in the wake of 9-11, trying to cooperate with the United States on joint interests in terms of preventing terror um, globally, to opposing the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, to by uh, 2009, um, when Medvedev was present, uh, president and Putin uh, was prime minister, um, tolerating closer cooperation with the United States on Afghanistan, uh, establishing a northern distribution network for our men and uh, women in the military and material going through Russia uh, into Central Asia to stage uh, our troops in Afghanistan signing the New START agreement in 2011. We've just upped, re-upped that for another five years uh, in February of this year, working together on the, um, on the Iran nuclear deal, the so-called JCPOA, which the Biden administration is now trying to reignite. Um, Putin, you know, is stepping in over uh, the red line or the line in the sand, I guess, that uh, Obama tried to establish in Syria over uh, Assad's use of uh, weapons of mass destruction and, and Putin stepping in and saying, wait, wait, I'll help get those out of Syria. But ending, all of this ended, this kind of cooperation uh, when, um, when Mr. Putin returned to the presidency in 2012 and his domestic political situation changed. And what we've seen uh, since is um, a more assertive a domestic policy um, becoming more autocratic at home in Russia and a more assertive Russian foreign policy. I think the other thing we've seen that's changed is the, um, the tools uh, with which uh, Putin's hardening autocracy has used to pursue this more sort of revanchist and assertive foreign policy. He's got more plentiful tools um, and uh, they are um, ever more powerful, sharper. And I think that uh, an increasingly unrestrained autocracy has enabled him to use those tools uh, um, uh, with, without uh, really any serious check um, on them. Um, both countries uh, and their respective governments have a, a variety of power tools and resources that they can use in international politics. And I think this is what's different is that, um, not to refer too much to my own work or my, my new book, Russia has to some degree resurrected. Um, and Dan, of course, wrote a book called The Return um, that, uh, that you know, looked at this too. Um, I've got my my book. It, it goes it says that there's also a big break uh, from 2012 after uh, Medvedev, uh, in particular, leaves the presidency and Putin comes back. So uh, Russia has, you know, enhanced its uh, geographic domain um, where it operates. It has made some new relationships, reestablished relationships. An important one is China. It is has it's particularly weighty in certain policy areas. And as long as we uh, the global energy uh, resources uh, are so dependent on oil and gas. Russia is one of the most weighty actors in, in um, those markets. Um, and it's also a big arms dealer and has been selling arms even to uh, NATO members like Turkey, for example, but also to India, to China, um, places in Sub-Saharan Africa, through the Middle East, even Saudi Arabia, our friends there. Um, and of course it has, um, uh, reformed its military and so has some of the more traditional means of power uh, in, in fighting form that it did not have when Joe Biden was last in office. Its economy is okay. It's not as, as bad uh, as uh, we sometimes like to think. Um, it's, uh, it could be better, of course, and that, that is something that's very important to Putin's administration because I think the most important thing to Mr. Putin's administration is stability uh, at home, domestic stability. Um, society is increasingly under pressure in Russia, as I mentioned, a hardening autocracy, increasingly willing uh, and less restrained in using the power resources it has. And it now has new, sh new or enhanced sharp power resources in the cyber area, as we've seen. And uh, it has a, a new ally, or at least a, a strategic partner in China, um, which also has bad relations with the United States. So all of this is the new sort of table, I think, um, that, that Biden is coming to. So just last few minute, a minute or two here, what's the agenda as we look toward this upcoming summit? 
um, between Biden and, and um, Putin. Well, Putin is obviously dealing with a rather different person in Joe Biden than he dealt with in Donald Trump. This is a, uh, a guy who he has met before. Uh, they know one another. I don't think they particularly like one another. We can all remember about a month ago, Biden, of course, as I mentioned, calling Putin uh, a killer. Um, uh, and um, Putin wishing Mr. Biden, perhaps ironically, uh, sarcastically, good health. Um, I think that was an allusion to his age, um, but also Putin's a killer. Um, so uh, we're not going to have anything like the Helsinki fiasco between Trump and Putin, where uh, Trump obsequiously uh, tried to befriend Putin and they liked one another. Biden doesn't care whether, uh, you know, it's not important to him whether Putin likes him. Um, so he's not going to pursue a friendship. Um, um, but I think it's going to be very pragmatic. And to be honest, we don't have many tools in the United States beyond what we're using already, um, which is sanctions, which are imprecise, but not completely ineffective to curb Russia and, and, and Russia's new foreign policy. Um, that said, we can't leave our values at the door um, as, uh, as I think Mr. Trump wanted to do. Um, but our own internal politics have weakened the degree to which um, we can raise Russia's uh, human rights or, or uh, democratic uh, lapses um, as well. That said, uh, I'm sure that Mr. Mr. Biden will raise the issue of Alexei Navalny and his imprisonment and his treatment. I'm sure he will raise um, Protasevich, um, the, uh, the Belarusian uh, journalist who was just pulled from the sky. Um, perhaps with Russia's help. Um, other things we should hope to accomplish, and I think basically the, the, the policy will be to de-link um, some of these issues where we wanna uh, cooperate with Russia. Um, we'll separate out areas of, of, of conflict. Um, uh, reinstatement of, of the Iran nuclear deal. Russia could be helpful here. They certainly have better relations with Iran, uh, especially because they've cooperated to a great degree over um, the Syria conflict since 2015. Some form possibly of a cybersecurity accord to enhance transparency, maybe. Um, there could be more nuclear arms control agreements on shorter and medium range um, weapons. Uh, Russia has developed a number of new weapons since uh, 2008 and their new look military reform. We think some of those might work actually. Um, and uh, the Arctic and climate change where Russia is really a heavyweight in, in terms of policy. Uh, and looking to access resources there. And then vaccines and coronavirus. But my expectations are not that great uh, for uh, this upcoming um, um, uh, summit. Um, Ukraine is the big issue and a harder issue. Um, and and um, it, you know, Russia is obviously much more invested in Ukraine than, than we are. I don't know that we would go to war uh, over Ukraine. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't. Um, but, uh, but Russia is sort of making moves towards uh, reigniting a conflict there, especially if they leave all of the troops. They have about 80,000 troops, maybe fewer now on the border uh, with Ukraine, which are apparently are now supposed to be for an exercise. Um, I think expectations overall are pretty min minimal for um, it, but um, the, the, the big reset here again is, uh, is back to stability and the policy will be to constrain Russia as best we can cooperate where we must and recognize that we're now in a three-way competition with Russia and China, who for the moment are cooperating with one another and not with us in most areas. So the reset is a policy of stability, predictability, back to deterrence of Russia as best we can, while acknowledging that there are some areas where cooperation could be useful, but not indispensable. Um, so with that, I'm turning things over to Dan. I'll mute myself. Hi, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this. Uh, it's a new administration and that's a good time to take stock. So let me say a few words about uh, what I think is the view from Moscow and then what, what's the view from Washington. And uh, you'll see, I'll, I'll take a slightly different uh, line than, than Catherine. I agree with a lot of what she said, but I, as you'll see, I'm a bit less optimistic. So at home, uh, Putin faces a pretty dreary reality. Uh, Russia's coming out of the coronavirus. They may get a temporary economic boost, but underneath uh, there's chronic stagnation. 
in the economy. Uh, real incomes of Russians were 11% lower in 2020 than in 2013. Euphoria over Crimea is long gone. Putin's ratings have stabilized in the low 60s. They're about 65% uh, percent approving of his performance at the moment. That might sound quite high, but actually it's not far above Putin's all-time low uh, since he's been in power uh, since 2000. And uh, in that 65%, there's not much enthusiasm. When asked what they like about Putin, only 3% mention honesty or decency. People don't have a lot of hope that, that things are gonna get better. And uh, as Catherine mentioned, discontent is being policed with an ever heavier hand. Now, if we look abroad, uh, we see Russia's active all over the place. In Syria, still propping up Assad, uh, in Ukraine, uh, they've been beefing up the forces in Crimea. Uh, Putin continues to back the brutal insurgency in Donbass. They recently rushed 100,000 troops to the border. It's not clear if they were planning something and then changed their mind or if the point was just to intimidate. On Russia's northern border, uh, Catherine mentioned the Arctic. Uh, well, they're militarizing it. Uh, they're doing up there something like what Xi Jinping is trying to do in the South China Sea keep asserting rights over international waters until they become accepted. And plenty of saber rattling. Uh, recently, Putin said that, quote, everybody, everyone wants to bite us somewhere. And he warned potential biters that, quote, we will knock their teeth out so that they cannot bite. Meanwhile, Russia is desperately trying to be useful to China as a fuel provider, uh, not just oil and gas, but now nuclear reactors. In fact, Russia has been using its atomic energy industry to spread influence around the world in many countries. That's just the more or less official uh, business in, in foreign, foreign affairs. Then there's the cloak and dagger stuff. Russian mercenaries, uh, loosely coordinating with the defense ministry, are active in Libya, the Central African Republic, Mozambique, other African countries. And then there are the intelligence agents. Uh, we've seen a pretty amazing level of activity by the GRU running aggressive operations across Europe, uh, trying to overthrow the government of Montenegro, poisoning the Skripals in Britain and an arms dealer in Bulgaria, assassinating Chechen emigres in Berlin, Vienna, France, Turkey, uh, blowing up an arms depot in the Czech Republic, hacking the Bundestag, hacking Emmanuel Macron's presidential campaign, hacking the DNC, hacking the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, uh, sheltering the hackers who took down a US oil pipeline very recently, uh, very possibly paying bounties to Taliban killers for hits on US troops in Afghanistan, very possibly using microwave weapons to sicken US diplomats. The scale of this malign activity is really remarkable. What lies behind this, I think, Putin believes that conflict with the West is unavoidable. We're out to get him, and his best defense is a kind of covert offense. Expand influence, exploit weaknesses, create problems, and use all tools available, create new ones. So switching now to the view from Washington, as I, as I see it, uh, Biden's line is that we want, as Catherine said, a predictable, stable relationship with Russia, but we'll continue to speak out against Russian misbehavior. This two-punch strategy was illustrated by Biden first calling Putin a killer and then inviting him to a summit. We've made clear that our priority is China. We don't want to be distracted by Russia uh, or the Middle East for that matter. So please keep things predictable and stable. Essentially, we're asking Putin to pipe down for the next few years until we get this China thing under control. The administration has made a serious start at rebuilding relations with Europe, which is great. So uh, that's the current strategy as I interpret it. It may be the best available, but there are some dangers. First, uh, let's be realistic. The last thing that Putin wants to give us is a predictable, stable relationship. He's going to try and make it unpredictable and unstable uh, to keep us distracted so the West can't unite around policies to constrain him. There are certain areas where maybe we can compartmentalize. 
Both sides seem pretty interested in nuclear arms control, possibly rules over military cyber attacks, possibly even Iran and North Korea. But beyond that, I think we can pretty much give up on predictability and stability. And Putin's now going to, he's going to be exploring just how much we're willing to pay uh, for a promise to make things a little bit more stable. He's going to repeatedly rock the boat to see how much we'll pay him to stop. I guess we do have to set priorities, uh, but saying publicly that China's the real priority empowers both Putin and Xi Jinping. Putin can exploit the fact that we don't want Russian distractions. Xi will exploit the fact that Biden has committed his prestige to getting some results vis-a-vis -vis Beijing. We've been here before many times. Remember Obama's pivot to Asia? Not the greatest success. This idea that you can just decide to focus on one part of the world and announce that, that's, it's not really how it works. So there's going to be a summit in Geneva. Of course, it's always good to talk. But there are phones, there's Zoom, there are pseudo impromptu side meetings at multilateral events. A summit is valuable to Putin at this point because it shows, shows Russian TV viewers that he's respected, he's not isolated. It also gives him a stage to act tough for all those watching at home. So why exactly are we doing this now? Usually we don't do summits with adversaries unless there are deliverables. Have deliverables been promised? Not that I know of. There's an unfortunate impression that Biden offered a summit to soften the fact that he called Putin a killer, making up for a verbal gaffe. Now at the summit, Biden will have to work pretty hard to avoid the impression that he's softened his positions on Russia. Of course, Biden will want the meeting to look civil, not friendship necessarily, but at least civil. But a positive summit, a friendly summit, will be taken by some as a sign that Biden's OK with the imprisonment of Navalny, the completion of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and the outrageous behavior of the GRU around the world. Of course, he's not OK with that. But he'll have to speak out forcefully and publicly on these issues and avoid smiling too much to resist the impression that he's gone wobbly. One thing the Biden administration is doing right is working to rebuild a common front with NATO allies and the EU. That's really the only hope for an effective policy against both China and Russia. But it's hard because there are so many actors who have an interest in doing deals on the side. The danger here is that you end up forging this powerful coalition by compromising on all the policies that you need this powerful coalition to pursue. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, is close to completion. It'll go from, from Russia to Germany. If completed, it will increase Europe's dependence on Russian gas, while at the same time weakening Poland and Ukraine by bypassing them. It's inconsistent with the EU's energy strategy. Uh, it was a bad idea in 2015 when it was begun. This was just a year after Russia seized Crimea and, and set off a civil war in Donbass. Uh, and at that point, uh, uh, European business thought it was a good moment to, to, to build a pipeline with Russia. It was a bad idea then, and it's still a bad idea. Uh, Anthony Blinken has said as much, but to avoid a clash with Angela Merkel, the White House waived sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 company and the Putin crony who heads it. The pipeline's a huge victory for Moscow and a few European firms at the expense of European energy security, at the expense of Ukraine security, and also at the expense of the environment. It's possible that the real Biden plan uh, is the real Biden plan is to quietly delay completion of the pipeline until after September, when we may see a coalition in Germany involving the Greens, who are determined to ban the pipeline. So maybe that's the real goal, uh, to, to quietly kick this down the road uh, until the Greens uh, are part of the government.
Dan, I think we've lost your connection. Is, are you? Yes, Cal, I was just saying, uh, let, let's turn it over to you at this point. I've, okay. I've probably said enough. Perfect, okay. There was a bit of a glitch at the end, but I think we're fine. So, um, so, so first of all, two very, very interesting overviews of a very complex situation. So I thought maybe we could start with just a couple of bigger picture issues and we sort of drill down on a few others. So I guess one thing, just listening to the both of you, I was struck by the notion, and I think I've heard others say this, but I just want to hear your reactions. Is Putin's fundamental, or let me speak of Russia perhaps, uh, Russia's fundamental interests in the near term globally, uh, can it be characterized as primarily instability? In other words, what Russia benefits from most is a disordered world. That's to either of you or both. I'm happy to take a stab at it. Uh, Cal, yes, I think at the moment, uh, because Putin has, and of course, there's a lot of interpretation. So Catherine may have a very different interpretation, but because I think Putin has given up on any meaningful partnership uh, with the West, and because he has a quite cynical uh, view of international politics and how the world works, uh, and because he has, despite all these energy resources and uh, other powers that might look impressive from outside, despite the, that, the fact that he's quite weak and domestically vulnerable uh, means that, yes, he will try to protect himself by creating instability, by distracting, by driving wedges between Western partners and uh, just trying to prevent in all the ways that he can any kind of unified front of the West to limit his options, to constrain him, and to put pressure on him politically, because I think he believes that that definitely the US and more broadly many in the West uh, would like to see a new political regime in Russia and have been uh, covertly working towards this for some years. Yeah, I would say that's right. I, I, in, in my book, actually, at uh, some of the things Dan went through there, I, I, our chapter four, um, but uh, or chapter three, sorry, in terms of where Russia's influence has, you know, its influence has grown and where it's active, uh, I would call it a disruptive power. I mean, that, that is its sort of power in disruption, uh, right? So look at look at how it sort of exacerbated the conflicts within American society through these sharp power or cyber means. Uh, it's done the same kind of thing in in Europe. Um, right. It's also uh, disrupted um, relations, or what we what we had historically had as strong relations in the Middle East, um, with by dealing bilaterally with uh, countries that are traditional enemies of one another. So you know, it actually has decent relations with Saudi Arabia and some relations with Iran, um, with Israel as well, with um, you know, with with the United Arab Emirates. So who's you know, investing in, in the Russian economy, which, yeah, the, I mean, in terms of macroeconomics, it, things are not that bad. It doesn't have that high debt. It, um, you know, inflation hasn't gone skyrocketing. Um, but, you know, longer term, the fundamentals are good. I, I think one of, I, I would agree with Dan in terms of how we think Mr. Putin might see the world. But one of the things I think too is that, um, is that he doesn't think long term, right? So his time horizons are, are pretty short. Um, and uh, it's, it's, there is you know, a real concern clearly with domestic stability. So NATO expansion is not what's going to bring down you know, his regime. What could bring down his regime is domestic instability. And, and so I think this is why Alexei Navalny is such an issue for him. Can we say one thing about why this summit is happening? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I, I agree with Dan that it it is hard to see where we're going to come out with a win uh, here and 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 what the deliverables are aside from just talking. Um, so it does make me wonder whether one of the things that Biden wants to do is deliver messages to Putin directly um, that that he doesn't want to go through an intermediary and and one of them is you know attack us in terms of cyber anymore and we will do the following to you and so really try to set up a deterrence policy um, that and, and getting the messaging very clear. Otherwise, I would, I would agree. It looks like it could, we could be handing Putin a big foreign policy 
win uh, in terms of his domestic politics and, and why exactly are we doing that is the question. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I think that's a really interesting issue. Maybe we'll circle back to that in some of the um, q and I'm also curious, so China came up incidentally in, our, in your remarks. Uh, you know, looking at this as someone who's not a Russia expert, uh, one of the things that's striking is on the one hand, Russia is obviously a militarily formidable country. On the other hand, you know, although its economy may be, you know, recovering or I'm forgetting the word I think Catherine used, recover, resurgent, you know, it's half the size of California. It's basically Southern California. It's tiny, tiny place. Yeah, it's the sixth ways. largest. I think it's the sixth largest in the world, but it's- but Compared to its GDP. great power competitors, tiny. Oh, sure, I, it's 3% of global GDP. Yeah, yeah. so yes, yeah, so obviously in, in a kind of general sense, it's a big country, but if you're saying US, China and Russia, there's an odd man out in that trio. And so that's, that's right. sort of a striking fact that Russia can't really escape. And, and moreover, it seems like, and I think you both supported this, that to agree that Russia is economically sound, it's based on 20th century uh, fossil fuel technologies, which may or may not prove resurgent over the next couple of decades. We'll see. You know, that's obviously a, a huge question, but we can imagine a world in which renewables and other things, which Russia may be good at, uh, but its traditional things won't be as good. So I guess I'm curious about how China fits into all of this, given the amazing difference in China's position over the last 30 years vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So how much of the story of Russia's current power or ability to disrupt is dependent on having a, a country, a friendly kind of, I say they're allies, because I don't really think they are, but I'd be curious if you think they are. Uh, but does China support or wingman activity help Russia do what it wants to do? I think it's more of a more than a wingman, um, but um, okay. So can I take the GDP question? Go ahead, so, Cal. I'm going to send you the PDF of my book uh, because there are different ways of thinking of uh, of Russia as a an actor in the world, right? So yes, absolutely. If you look at its GDP and compare it to the U.S. or to China uh, or even to India, uh, it looks small. Um, it, it is about the same as the UK's, uh, or um, I'm Canadian, so I'll say Canada's. Uh, it's about like 65, I, I, I'm forgetting exactly what it is at the moment, but uh, it looks small uh, relative to the other two quote unquote great powers. All right, but I would say don't look just at GDP um, uh, in, in terms of a measure of uh, Russia's importance um, economically, globally, because that's what you're getting at, right? Is that this is not a huge economy, it's not a huge market, and it's not a huge supplier. Um, and China is, and the US is. Oh, where does Russia matter is what I would suggest you should look at instead. And for now, 80% of global energy, it comes from fossil fuels. Um, you know, only 3% of us, cause we're in California here, we think electric cars are so great. I went to visit my daughter in New Orleans. Uh, she's a student at Tulane. They don't have a lot of electric cars, even in New Orleans, right? So, I mean, let's forget, don't forget we're still in a bubble here. So 80% of the world's, energy still coming from fossil fuels and that's natural gas and oil. Well, who's one of the world's two largest exporters of both of those things? Russia, right? So it's a particularly weighty actor in a particularly important sector of the global economy. Now, granted, you go into Target, you're not gonna find a lot of things that say made in Russia. You're gonna find a lot of things said that say made in China, made in Taiwan. Russia's not, Russia doesn't sell consumer goods. They sell, as Dan said, um, uh, nuclear power plants, they sell them to China, they've sold 12 of them there, they sell them to India, they sell them across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, they sell weapons, they're the world's second largest purveyor of weapons, we are number one, what do they sell? They sell S-300 anti-ballistic missile systems, S-400s, um, these are expensive and they come with a chain of maintenance contracts and that means Russian engineers on the ground, who are the two of their largest customers, well they have big customers in the Middle East and in Africa, Two of their largest customers are actually China and India. Um, so um, the dependency, you, know, you don't think of Russia's economy just in terms of GDP, in terms of its weightiness in certain policy areas, it's really quite important. And China has you know, a huge need obviously still for energy. Now in the long run, we can all say, yes, that's not a stable way for Russia's economy to grow. That's true, but it all depends on us fundamentally changing our behavior and getting off oil and, and gas as, as our main areas of, uh, as our, our main sources of energy. And right now there isn't a huge 
well, I mean, we're trying to do that, but we haven't done it yet. And as I, and I point back to short time horizons on Putin's part. And the other thing is Russia has slightly started to diversify its economy. I don't want to overstate it. They now are the world's biggest you know, exporter of grain, for example. They export pharmaceuticals um, um, as well. Um, uh, so I'm going to stop there and let Dan comment. Sure. So on relations with China, I think Putin would very much like to be seen as a major partner of, of, of China's. He, he wants the uh, moral support of China in opposing the US and the West. Uh, and he would like more economic support from, from China. Uh, at, at the moment, it's, it, it's a kind of a one-sided relationship, as, as has been pointed out. It, the Russian economy is very small compared to either China's or the US. Uh, the big competition is between the US and China. And uh, of course, that's irritating to Putin, but it's, it's a fact. So what can they do? They can sell gas, oil, and nuclear power plants to, to China, as, as Catherine said. Um, but uh, China has a lot of uh, power over the terms, uh, and they have conflicting interests in Central Asia. There are other uh, energy suppliers from Central Asia, which China can also uh, turn to, uh, to improve the bargains with Russia. So. Both, I think, she and Putin like to pretend that they're great friends, that they're they're uh, on the same page, and that they're working together. In fact, uh, the relationship isn't that close. Uh, it's opportunistic, and uh, it's more, in my view, uh, working to the advantage of China than working to the advantage of Russia. Um, at the same time, Putin uh, has to face the distinct possibility that demand for uh, for gas from Europe is going to decrease substantially. Uh, and in that case, that makes him even more, more dependent on China uh, for those energy sales, um, which again, reduces his leverage. Terrific. Thank you both. So there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. And so we have about 15 minutes. I'm going to pivot to those. Um, and so why don't we start, there, there's a number of different things uh, that we could begin with, but one of the questions um, asks whether Putin's concept of, of Russia's geopolitical interests uh, represents a sort of continuum of expansion going back to, you know, Peter the Great, uh, Stalin, etc. You know, in other words, is this just uh, normal Russian behavior over centuries, or is there something distinctly Putin-esque about what we're seeing today? And if so, what would that be? So I'm sort of uh, embroidering the question a bit, but what's what's uniquely Putin and what's just basic Russian, what Kennan might have written? Do you, yeah, do you wanna go first on that one, Dan? Sure. I, I, well, it, it might sound, sound strange, uh, given that I started by pointing out all the aggressive international actions uh, that we've been seeing, but, uh, I mean, first of all, I don't think these historical, these long-term historical deterministic arguments tell us very much because countries can always go down different paths. There's always some choice. But if we look at Putin and expansion, uh, he's been extremely cautious. Uh, he only really started quite late uh, into his uh, time, in, time in power. So there was Georgia, which I think was actually provoked uh, by the Georgian side. Uh, although clearly uh, the Russian side was 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 quite eager to respond, uh, and then you get Crimea in uh, 2014, a lot of troublemaking at the borders, an attempt to influence the former Soviet republics. But uh, if he had really been a, his, a, a traditional Russian expansionist, I think we would have seen a lot more of this much earlier on. Rather, I think what we've seen is a progression, and, and Catherine uh, mentioned this, a progression in Putin's attitude towards international affairs. And I would say this growing uh, belief uh, that opportunities for cooperating with the West just don't exist, except on very uh, uh, small uh, compartmentalized cases um, so, you know, if, if he were an expansionist, uh, I think we'd have seen actions in the Baltics, uh, possibly uh, with regard to Kazakhstan. And at, 
at many of the borders at moments of weakness uh, among the neighbors. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's taken a very long time. And he clearly prefers, when possible, to use all the instruments of uh, security service uh, uh, activity rather than military invasion. And that's in part because the world has changed. Uh, even if Putin wanted to expand uh, in, in the manner of Peter the Great or, or, uh, or Catherine the Great, obviously we're living in a completely different world. Can, can I come in on that one too, Cal, or do you want to move on? It's up to you. Do you if you want to, you, oh, you don't yeah. have to both feel you need to answer each question, right. but if you, right. if you'd like, please go ahead. Sure. Uh, so I would, I would just say, I see it, I understand that I don't think these historically deterministic arguments get us very far right, uh, in terms of tradition. And I do think there has been a progression in Putin's thinking, um, partly in response to, to what he perceives happened with, with uh, U.S. policy and a lack of cooperation, but, um, but also in response to his own domestic politics. And there, has been, there have been ways in which you know, his foreign policy has helped him domestically. Um, in terms of raising his own approval ratings. That said, you know, I think we can run a counterfactual, right? Would any leader behave the same way as Vladimir Putin when faced with the same, you know, policies from the United States? And I think the answer is no, they wouldn't. Um, there's not an inevitability to conflict. Uh, there, there, you know, competition is different from conflict. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you know, we did see differences with Medvedev. We saw differences with early Putin, for that matter. We saw um, um, Mikhail Gorbachev. We saw Boris Yeltsin. So I, you know, I, I don't, I do think there's something about hardening autocracy, more aggressive foreign policy, um, and this idea of being kind of under siege um, is is a useful narrative domestically for him as well. Great, thank you. So next question is, uh, is there a reason why Putin does not think long term? It seems a little odd considering how his power is so deeply entrenched. Um, so the chances of him voting, being voted out are slim. Um, but I guess maybe I would add to that question. The contrast that we often hear is allegedly Xi Jinping is such a long term thinker or the Chinese are thinking on a decades or centuries long scale. I'm not going to say whether that's really accurate or not, but that's that's a common statement about Chinese foreign policy. But you both sort of stressed short termism in Putin's thinking. So maybe elaborate on why that that contrast exists. Well, one reason is that this is not a very democratic uh, regime. I mean, in fact, you have greater long term security in a democracy with uh, established institutions. You can look to the future than than in an autocracy where basically every day is a new day. And uh, because there isn't a moment when you will uh, be stepping down or will be undergoing a genuine electoral uh, contest, uh, if you're going to be overthrown, it could come at any time. So I think, uh, although he looks very secure, uh, mafia bosses often look very secure. The ones, the ones that last for a long time, uh, it's, it's not because they're thinking strategically and long term necessarily. It's because they're very good at the day to day uh, identifying threats and, uh, and resolving the problem. Um, and I think that's his view of the world. I mean, not, not that I can provide you with any very strong evidence. But uh, if you look at what he said over the last 20 years, how he talks about things, and put that together with what he's done, uh, you form an impression in, of, of somebody who's looking at the world as a million things going on simultaneously. It's very difficult to predict uh, beyond you know, a very short time scale. And uh, you see a great desire to keep his options open um, so that he can respond tactically. Now, what, what we see if we look at other authoritarian regimes historically is that that many of them, I did, did a study of this, many of them end uh, because of mistakes by the incumbent uh, in unforeseen circumstances. So, you know, whatever the uh, brilliance of the plans you may have created, what, how, whatever you know, pseudo democratic institutions you've you've established, and those may help to some extent, uh, you're still vulnerable to just 
unexpected circumstances that provoke you into making mistakes, which then snowball and lead to the end of the regime. So I think he has a realistic view of the world as, as not something that one can control and lacking uh, a kind of institutionalized political system, uh, which everybody believes will constrain things going forward. There's no reason to, to, to think that you can plan, you know, 10 years ahead. Right. It's very typical of a personalistic autocracy, which is what it's become. It wasn't always that, but yeah, I would completely agree. Under institutionalization, lack of regular process makes you vulnerable to some kind of exogenous shock or, uh, you know, a event uh, or elite overthrow even. Um, and and so he, this is one reason why he cares so much about public opinion, which is kind of odd in an autocracy, you might think, right? But it's a resource for him uh, in the system in, in which he works. It keeps other elites at bay. Um, when he has such high approval ratings. So that's all I would add. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the reasons in China that after Mao's disastrous reign that the system was changed to disallow long-term rule and now is being changed back was precisely that. So it certainly makes a lot of sense. So next audience question, what is the role that Europe does or should play in keeping Russia's ambitions at bay? You can't play any, I would say. I mean, that's one thing that has changed. I would say Russia is the preeminent power now in Europe. Um, and, you know, European Union's strength is in its unity. Its weakness is in its unity, uh, it, the requirement for unity, right? And so Russia has worked quite hard to try and, and, and split that up with some success. I mean, a lot of resentment over Germany and Nord Stream 2. Um, and, um, um, you know, the Europeans have kept the sanctions on Russia, which was a surprise, um, but that's always a worry. I think every time they come up for renewal, um, probably Germany has the most leverage um, over Russia, but with Angela Merkel leaving power soon, she had at least some sort of personal relationship also to the extent that that matters with Putin. So I, I don't think there's a ton of leverage there uh, anymore, especially uh, given the, this, the, as Dan said, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline will be completed. And um, this makes Germany at least even more, and arguably other parts of, of, uh, of Europe, but in particular Germany, even more dependent on Russia, at least for now, right? At least for now. Can I just ask, Catherine, do you think that was a mistake, Nord Stream 2? From what perspective? From Germany's perspective, it's not. Um, from uh, Russia's perspective, it's not. Uh, I think we wish it hadn't, but you know, what were the, Germany, what were the options? Uh, na natural gas is not easy to move, right? It comes out of the ground as gas. Then you have to liquefy it to put it through the pipelines and then you have to make it gas again when it arrives. So only some countries can do that. And uh, it's, you know, much harder to move than oil. So there's Russia sitting there with, with a lot of natural gas. What are the options? As, and if you're committed, as Germany is, to not using nuclear power, right, they decided that after uh, Fukushima Daiichi in, in Japan, then what are you going to do? Uh, well, oil, they've decided is too dirty. It's very dirty. Uh, coal, dirty. Uh, so what's the option? Natural gas. Who's got a lot of it sitting right there? Cheaply, Russia. Who's got the technology to liquefy it and turn it back into a gas? Russia. So what were the options exactly? Russia, the United States was not moving it over. Uh, you know, we, we don't have that capacity yet. It, so good or bad, I mean, it's unfortunate from a geostrategic point of view, but, um, but what was the option? I, I would disagree a little bit with that. I, I mean, I think there were options. It, Merkel decided that she was going to overnight uh, shut down the nuclear uh, sector. Uh, sure. was, that, was that really necessary? Was, was, was that uh, environmentally uh, progressive, um, and yeah, there was that's a fair the, point. The, the, there were pipelines. The, the, there are other pipelines. Um, so to to build this new pipeline, uh, I'm not sure that 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 was the only option. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say more generally, I totally agree with with Catherine that that what Europe could do to defend against Russia would require them to unite uh, a bit more. They need to uh, re rewrite the rules of the EU. They, they need to, first of all, start contributing more to NATO and organizing NATO, uh, the, NATO the European NATO countries, uh, to create a better uh, deterrent against uh, Russia around 
uh, Russia's borders, they need to cut the sleaze. I mean, it's, it, it, this has gotten much worse in the last 20 years. Former politicians, there's three Austrian uh, high level former politicians who have recently served on the boards of Gazprom and Rosneft. Uh, not to mention stadium. Gerhard Schroeder. Uh, well, Schroeder is a, yeah, he, he so started early, but since yeah. then, you know, three Austrians, Germans, uh, the lobbyists for, for uh, Russia, there should be regulations about lobbying on behalf of a foreign state. Uh, I, I personally think that it should be, a, <clears throat> you know, we don't really need that. It, that could be banned at this point. Yeah. Um, and so many uh, enablers in the West who have basically helped to uh, incapacitate uh, the European Union and its relations with, with Russia and more generally to weaken Western policy. I think there are a lot we could do and a lot the Europeans could do. It requires monitoring, uh, much better monitoring. It requires, frankly, improvement of the security services. It's, it's really just amazing that Bellingcat and other investigative journalists, journalists and, and uh, open source investigators can come up with all this information, some of which apparently the security services didn't have, or at least they weren't sure, it didn't seem to be acting on them. So I, I think there's a lot of things we can do in terms of, or the Europeans can do in terms of legal reforms, uh, constitutional reforms within the EU, uh, new regulations, and just much more active monitoring of the many contacts. Not, I'm not saying we should reduce contacts with Russia, but we need to monitor what's going on and, and we need to enforce anti-corruption legislation much better. They should do all of those things. The problem is they can't get it together to do any of those things. Well, I think yeah. maybe they will a bit more, but if they can't get it together, it's because of people like Merkel who are signing mm -hmm. these deals over Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2 and, and who are just not making it a priority. I, I think uh, I, I think if, if different leaders, we talked about the importance of individuals, I think if there had been different leaders in Britain, France, and Germany uh, in the last 10 years, they might have chosen to do a bit more. Mm -hmm. Catherine, any last words? We're almost out of time. No, I would, I would generally agree with that. But I do think that, that you know, um, uh, Putin's Russia has been able to also exploit, you know, the structural requirement of unanimity um, with the European Union as well, and then also try to sort of uh, finance right-wing populism throughout Europe where, where they found it, which is uh, that sort of a new tool um, that they're willing to use um, to, to some effect, you know, it'd be hard to know exactly. But, um, but, that, but anyway, I, I think, you know, we're not going to have warm, fuzzy relations with Russia uh, anytime soon. Uh, and um, I, I think the best we can hope for is some sort of predictability and stability, which is in our interest, sometimes in Russia's interest. Um, but uh, right, I think just their power is in disruption and um, that, that will be the sort of longer term strategy. Great. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for coming on. And Dan, of course, as well. This has been a terrific discussion. I want to plug Catherine's book again, Russia Resurrected. I, <laughs> I'm apparently getting a PDF and I'm eager for it. <laughs> for the rest of you, I recommend uh, going out. I'm sure it's on Amazon and everywhere it else. It is on Amazon, in Kindle and Perfect. Yeah. So thank you both for a uh, discussion that I am positive we will circle back to in the years to come. Uh, so thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for thank having you. me.